It's my privilege to introduce Matt Bennett to you this morning. We're glad to have him here at our Adult Education Hour. Matt was here this weekend with, uh, as the commencement speaker for Westminster's uh, graduation. He's the founder and president of Christian Union, a Christian leadership development organization with the mission, listen to this mission, to bring sweeping spiritual and cultural transformation to our nation and the world by developing and networking Christian leaders to make an impact for Christ. Now I'm gonna tell you more about Matt and more about the ministry, but what I've been so challenged and encouraged by in the last few days being with Matt again, who uh, it's not our first time to be together in, in meetings, uh, but it's very encouraged and reminded again of his commitment to unleashing the power of the Holy Spirit. You, know, you think about strongholds in our nation and transformation and uh, the power of the gospel. Where does that come from? Is it persuasive speech? Uh, is it uh, intellectual apologetics and arguments? Well, yes, we should be persuasive and we've, got, we've been given the Word of God, but it's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. And as believers, understanding that that power is unleashed by drawing near to God in prayer and fasting and calling upon the Holy Spirit to bring about change in our lives and change uh, in the culture around us. That's what we need. We need a revival. We need believers to be convinced that it's the work of the Spirit and we should long for it. That's what we're seeing around the world, aren't we? Places where the gospel is expanding in power and being unleashed. It's not fancy strategies and it's not apologetic arguments per se. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So I've been challenged by his commitment uh, in prayer and to lead his staff that way. Uh, Matt is a native of Houston and uh, finished at Cornell University in uh, undergrad as well as an MBA there and then a Master of Divinity at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's worked with Campus Crusade for Christ uh, for several years at Princeton and some of our members and our Westminster graduates were a part of his ministry there. They were back this weekend for a reunion. And then uh, Matt has gone on to found Christian Union and uh, you may have read about Christian Union, their strategy of developing Christian leaders in two spheres of influence. First, among students of the nation's most influential secular universities, Brown, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, Penn, Princeton, and Yale. And then also working among professionals in one of our nation's most influential cities in New York. The ministry has been featured in New York Times, PBS, National Public Radio, Christianity Today, and World Magazine. And we're very privileged to have Matt with us this morning. Uh, please welcome him as he comes to share his heart and share about the ministry. Thanks, Matt. Mm. All right, good morning. Can you hear me okay? This is working all right? Well, we're going to start off with a, a video, uh, but I wanted to first say um, thank you for having me here these last couple of days. It was wonderful to be part of the commencement at Westminster Schools uh, yesterday. Um, having known graduates of the schools for many years, as Mike was mentioning, I got acquainted with some of the graduates back in the mid-90s who uh, came to Princeton when I was with Campus Crusade for Christ and got to know the Hanks during that time, David and Betty and, and many others, the Olivers. And uh, it's really a joy and an honor to be with you here this weekend, the last couple of days. And uh, having heard about so many of you and now being able to meet so many of you in person, it's been a great blessing. So I really appreciate that. And uh, what I'm going to uh, share about this uh, morning is a little bit about what we are doing as a ministry, what God's called us to in terms of the need to develop uh, Christians as leaders to make an impact for Christ in our larger society. And so I thought a good way to start this off would be a video that recently got put together by uh, our ministry. It's five minutes long and it describes just what's going on at Princeton. Princeton was our first ministry and since then we've expanded to Harvard, then Yale, uh, Cornell, Dartmouth, Cor uh, um, Columbia, and we'll be starting Penn this summer and then we'll add uh, Brown, the last of the eight Ivy League schools, the next summer. But uh, Princeton is the oldest, and so um, this is highlighting just what uh, God's been doing there. So uh, take a look. You'll get a sense of uh, what God's called us to as a ministry, and then we'll go from there. So go ahead.
this campus can by and large be a place where Christian faith um, can oftentimes be looked down upon, seen as less than intellectually astute and engaging. There are so many ways that your faith is challenged, whether it's from your classmates or professors who will flat out say things that are just like, if you believe in this God, it's just irrational. In our research, we found that there is such a concentration of the nation's future leaders at just such a few colleges. And there are over 2,500 colleges in the United States, yet just eight of them produce over 50% of the top leaders in government, business, education, media, and everything else. We call ourselves a leadership development ministry. It's in line with our mission, it's in line with who we want to be as an organization. We want to be developing leaders to transform culture. Christian Union's specific ministry presence on Princeton's campus has grown from less than one half of one percent to uh, eight percent of the undergraduate population. The centerpiece, what I think of our of our ministry, uh, the thing that I actually get most excited about is our, our Bible courses. We really give our students a, a biblical vision, theological content, but we're really trying to say, hey, what are the implications for this deep, weighty theological content in your campuses? And then priming the pump for what the implications for that will be in culture one day. There's an amazing breadth of students represented, but there's also such a deep love and devotion to Christ that characterizes our students. There's definitely just a huge stigma and a huge culture that goes along with being an athlete here, you know. It's the whole adage of play hard, party hard, but, you know, with with the help of God, with the Spirit, with the, you know, the community, it's really been a great time kind of being on that outside looking in, but also grabbing more guys out of there so they can stand on the outside with me. Taking a student from freshman to senior year is, is really an exhilarating thing to see them go from raw material, a lot of potential, to hopefully by God's grace and by the Spirit, a person who's equipped to, to have a godly impact. If we can get into their lives and really help to inculcate these um, Christian values, we feel like that will be good for society as a whole. In terms of over oh, the next longer period of time, we're really um, praying hard, working hard, that by the year 2020, we can see 20% of the student involved in Christian ministry of some sort. It's not uncommon for us to have waiting lists for some of our activities on these campuses. It breaks our heart to have to turn students away. There's such a great interest and a need. The more funding it exists, the more ministry fellows exist and more students who hear the gospel, who are blessed and trained as Christian leaders to go out. It's that straightforward by God's grace. Please consider and make a gift.
All right, is this still on? Okay, good. Well, we praise God for what he's doing in students' lives, and uh, it's just uh, incredible to see him do these things by his grace, through the generosity of so many, through the prayers of so many, through the hard work of so many. God is doing some uh, incredible things. And I hope you're encouraged when you saw this video. And, you know, so many students uh, involved at Princeton. And what's remarkable is at Harvard, the uh, student involvement is growing at a faster rate than at Princeton. Um, Princeton's bigger because it got started earlier. And the same can be said for the other campuses started after that, Harvard and Columbia, Dartmouth and Cornell. So praise God for that. Now, of course, these places are still very secular places. You have 10% of the student body uh, or the freshmen involved in Bible courses, but that still leaves 90% doing all sorts of other things. So it's, it's not exactly heaven on earth uh, yet, but uh, we praise God for what he is doing and are hoping and trusting him to do a lot more in the future to really bring a significant change to these campuses and therefore to our larger culture. And so I know you guys have a um, some a heart for reaching influencers because I was talking with your pastor about that and he said some of you have been looking at the teachings of James Davison Hunter and his book and it's that sort of mindset and heart which is why I began this ministry 10 years ago because um, what happened was when I went to school at Cornell and then later I was with Campus Crusade for Christ at Princeton I noticed two things about the campuses one very very secular places I grew up in Houston, Texas, and the contrast between what was available in terms of being able to grow in Christ and knowledge about him from Houston to going up to Ithaca, New York at Cornell, and the same at Princeton, was really, really startling. So many people, in so many ways, so educated, yet so ignorant of the most important message ever given to humanity by the God and creator of the world himself. Um, so, and because of that, uh, so much spiritual darkness. But at the same time, I noticed, starting at Cornell, and then uh, even more when I was at Princeton, how many famous alumni were uh, coming out of these schools. It was just, I never knew that growing up in Houston. And just person after person is uh, mentioned, or, or I, I recognize as a person who's an alumnus of the schools. And so I realized what a bad combination this is to have places that are so secular, and then at the same time end up being so influential. You know, we did some more formal research a few years ago and uh, looked at leaders in government, business, education, and media, and it comes down to about usually 50%. I mean, you look at government, and six of the last 10 presidents went to these schools. Of course, uh, Obama did, and, and Bush did, and Clinton, and, and others. And then the Supreme Court, actually every member of the U.S. Supreme Court went to at least one of these schools, and some of them went to several. And you look at the advisors around the president, about 30% of his advisor in his cabinet uh, went to these schools. And so that's just government. But the same sort of phenomenon exists at other spheres as well. If you look at business, you look at the uh, 10 wealthiest people in the United States, and half of them went to these schools. You look at the leaders of the top internet companies, and half of them went to these schools. Even though they're out in California, still they kind of migrate out there and, and take positions of leadership. You see the same in media, the heads of the top media companies, the ones that control and dictate what we watch on TV and, and every other form of media, and half of them went to these schools. And the publishers and editors of the top uh, 20 magazines in the United States, same phenomenon. Uh, so uh, in education, you see that again, the leaders of the top 10 public districts, school districts in the United States, half of them went to these schools. So it goes on and on, and I thought, wow, what an interesting phenomenon. Of course, influential leaders come from all the colleges in the U.S., and of course, some don't even go to college, but there's an amazing concentration at these places. And if that's the case, wouldn't it make sense to focus our hearts, minds, activity at these places in order to reach these people with the gospel, to develop them and strengthen them. Because for so many, and for so many years, uh, the students going to these schools, they could barely hang on, those who are Christians going in. And of course, local churches and other ministries have been doing wonderful work for years. But I sense that uh, a great increase was needed in terms of activity and focus so that we could see a lot more students strengthen. You know, the students who came from uh, Westminster um, up there, they had the privilege of having a strong foundation coming into college uh, in terms of the gospel and integrating that mindset with, um, 
uh, with um, their academics. But so many students coming in, even those who are Christian, they do not have that kind of preparatory background. It just doesn't exist. And so what you have here with your school is really a unique and wonderful thing. And uh, what we do on campus is needed for all students, but I'd say especially for the vast majority who have very little Christian training, even though they are Christians coming in. And then, of course, the non-Christians, so many who have had so little exposure. It's really shocking. I mean, I, I think of this one young woman who came to faith recently, and she, before she became a Christian, she had never been in a church in her entire life. I mean, not even for a wedding. I mean, for nothing. She had no exposure. And so, so many have their faith shaped by just what they get on TV and through the media of different kinds. And that's not a great way to get an understanding of what Christianity is, because it's not true. It's not who Jesus is. And so, so many people's perceptions are considerably off and engenders a hostility that doesn't have to be there. They simply don't know who Jesus is. So the ministry began 10 years ago for that mission to develop and then network these Christian leaders together in order to have an impact in our nation. Our, our deep yearning, our desire, our passion is that 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, our nation will look different because so many of the leaders have been being influenced for Christ. And our view is that not everyone, of course, is going to come to faith in Christ, but it doesn't mean that they still can't be influenced in some wonderful ways. You know, I uh, heard uh, Bill Gates' commencement speech at Harvard a few years ago, and he, as far as I know, is not a Christian. Um, I, don't, I don't know that. I don't think he is, but he uh, was giving the reasons in his commencement address on why he started his uh, philanthropic efforts. And he said when he was at Harvard, he loved the people, he loved the intellectual development, but he never learned about the needs of the world, and he didn't know his responsibility to do something about it, given his position of influence. And he said it was through letters that his mother wrote him. And I think she is Episcopalian. I think she would write him letters and quote the book of Luke to him and say, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so it's through that influence, he says, that he began his philanthropic work. And so the reason I bring that story up is that many on these campuses may not come to faith, but it doesn't mean they can't be influenced to make a, a stronger and better impact on society. Um, either while they're on campus and, of course, through their network of friends for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years out, that they would have Christian friends who would say, hey, would you consider investing your life this way? Would you think about uh, doing good for other people and using your position of wealth and influence to bless other people? So that's our deep heart and passion and desire to work with the other Christian ministries on campus and local churches to see God do this sort of radical change. Now, another part of what I want to mention and talk to you about today is the values. A lot of people ask and say, why do you think you've been able to see God do so much in this, these contexts? And I want to list a few reasons why we believe God has been working so powerfully and the means of his grace on campus. Then I'll share a little bit about impact. But it comes down to four values of the ministry, and I'll talk about three of them. And the first one is um, so important, and Mike was referring to it when he was up here, and that is an emphasis on, on seeking God wholeheartedly. We call it a seeking God lifestyle. And this is a longer story to go into and to explain, but at the core of it is a conviction that what's laid out in the scriptures in terms of what's expected, in terms of our energy and effort in seeking after God, is not what's lived by most of us Christians in the United States. It's, it's been lived by our forefathers, these people who participate in great revivals in the United States. But I think we've slowly sort of pulled back in terms of our effort and energy and drawing close to God. And as I've talked to people over the years and, and tried to find out, you know, for my own self and others why this is, you know what I think it comes down to in many ways is that we're, we're very strong and want to emphasize very much that it's by God's grace alone that we come to faith in Him, which is absolutely true. But then we forget to talk about and reemphasize that He gives us more grace as we put effort into drawing the, close to Him. And when I say put effort, I'm not saying we then merit the things He gives us. Just as we come to faith through Jesus Christ through repentance and faith, it's still, we haven't merited it, but it's, it's through the means of repentance and faith that uh, we get salvation. So there are means in which we receive more grace and access to God. And those means are 
prayer and fasting, setting apart Christ as Lord, taking in the scriptures in, in large ways at a high rate, and God pours out his grace on us in some wonderful ways. Let me read this passage from Romans 5.1. What I like about this passage is that it emphasizes one and two. It emphasizes both the grace that we stand in in Christ by virtue of becoming born again, but then also the access we have for more grace. In Romans 5.1 it says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's emphasizing the grace we have in him by coming to faith. It says, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. So we, by God's grace, are standing in a place with him in grace where we have even more access to him to pour out his love on us in extraordinary ways. And this is what you see in the book of Acts. You see when the Spirit of God comes in Acts chapter 2 and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet, just a few chapters later, they're all together. It says, and when they prayed, when they came together, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they spoke the Word of God boldly. Now, they had already been filled with the Spirit, but here they needed another filling of the Spirit. And that particular passage emphasized the role of prayer in it. But there are a number of factors that go into this. And so as we seek Him through these means, God does extraordinary things. And so what this video, what it doesn't show so much is what happened four years ago. And that is when as a ministry, we began praying together two hours every day. And this was a radical shift for us. Now, all the people on our staff, of course, are godly people. Many have been um, pastors before they joined us. We typically hire older people to join us. Many older, I mean, meaning not right out of college. So usually they're in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Many um, have been overseas and missionaries before they join us, and, and most have advanced theological degrees. So they're all godly people. So we began praying two hours a day, and it took a lot of kind of talking through. Why would we do this? And the story of, of how you know, the Lord led me to, to do this is a longer one, but um, in that process, God really started to meet us in extraordinary and wonderful ways. I would say it was probably six months of doing that, and we saw immediate, just tangible, dramatic changes in the campus. You know, the ministry was already always growing before, but the responsiveness of the student body and eagerness just took a dramatic leap forward. Before, we would work hard to get students involved in our Bible courses and other programs, and we still work hard. But as one person put it, he says, before it's like we were rowing um, across um, the, a lake and we're working hard and seeing progress. And, but then and everything changed. It was like we were in a sailboat and the wind is just kind of pushing us along. And, you know, and there are many examples I can uh, give of this, but um, the spirit of God coming so powerfully into some of our meetings that students would just on their own and prompt to just fall on their faces and praise God or uh, start to confess their sins openly. I mean, just remarkable sort of um, demonstrations that the Spirit is working uh, in, in our midst. And some of our staff members saying, you know, I see now happen in students' lives in one semester what I'd hope to see happen in their lives over the three or four years involved with us. It's that sort of dramatic and powerful change in so many of their lives. And even, and what's remarkable too is, it's not like we changed our strategies in, in terms of seeing fruit, but we saw the number of students coming to faith double the next year, and then double the year after that, and then still increase after that. We didn't change any of our strategies. It was just the Spirit of God, by His grace, was stirring people up to have a hunger and want to come to Him. And one, uh, another way in which this is manifested, which was uh, interesting, was, um, we get these emails about once a week where people would say, hey, I don't know anyone in your ministry on campus. I don't know anything about your organization, never met anyone, but I feel like I need to get right with God. And so I, I Googled and looked you up and I want to meet with you. Now, these things just don't happen in these kind of contexts. And that they would begin happening once a week show that it wasn't our increased effectiveness in communication or anything. It was just the Spirit of God stirring up people's hearts. He's hearing our prayers and responding. Praise His name. And it wasn't just our staff who prayed increase. It was also so many of the students. They kind of got a holy jealousy. 
and changed their lives in significant ways. And they began praying, so many of them, in the morning and at night, um, and, uh, and sometimes in the middle day as well. We have a noon prayer time, a noon to one on a lot of the campuses, where a lot of students will come and make sure they have an hour of prayer, maybe 10 minutes of devotion, and then rest prayer each day. And it has a powerful, enlivening sort of impact. And you know, our, our staff members who work with the students, I mean, they now had two less hours every day to minister to the students. But so many of the problems and difficulties and troubles and stuff just kind of evaporated. And they're able to see much more happen in their much less available time, even though they took two hours out. I mean, amazing, right? I mean, I shouldn't be amazed because the scriptures say all this, but it's still wonderful and amazing to see all of that. And fasting is also an important part of, of what we do. We fast as a ministry together, all together. Um, sometimes, sometimes there's individual sort of fasting uh, initiatives. I just finished a 40-day fast a few weeks ago. A number of us will fast for longer periods of time. And so much of what we see happen, we attribute to this prayer and fasting. And I do find people will ask and, and want to know some of the particulars of our strategies in reaching out and engaging. And those are important. And by no means am I saying that that's not important. However, I would say what's even more important is that we are in line with our living and loving Father and that we have his presence and power to activate and energize the strategies he gives us. Because other than that, it just gets frustrating and difficult and we feel like we just can never succeed. You know, let me read one, uh, another verse for you here. I think this in many ways can characterize the American church. And of course, there are many exceptions to this. Uh, American Christians, we... Um, but um, I think it can still um, characterize us. It says, What shall I do with you? Hosea 6, 4. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. So it's not like they didn't have love for God, but he, he attributed their love like the dew in the morning. And you get up and you get going in the day and then it evaporates and it's gone. And for American Christians, our love isn't fully what it needs to be. We have a love for God, but it needs to be more robust. It needs to be stronger. What it, and tangibly, it means taking action in terms of the amount of time that we pray and fast and read the scriptures and set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts because then extraordinary and wonderful power is released. Um, it's wonderful when I get exposed and see and get inspired by ministries and churches that uh, live this sort of life. And I was in, at a Brooklyn church two, uh, two weeks ago. And they just had such a, an amazing sort of spiritual life to them. And so I asked the pastor about it. And he said, you know, 10 years ago, they were struggling. They had 80 to 100 members. They didn't have a, a building. And they were meeting in different places. They had some leadership in the church, uh, one particular family that just gave them a difficult time. It was just constant struggle. And they just came to the end of themselves. And so they went away and began praying for, they prayed for, I think, for three days for God to work powerfully. And they saw God start to move. And the church now has almost a thousand members in a wonderful building that they're expanding. And um, so many other, and this family that's causing trouble, they moved on. And uh, so many good things happening there in the church and so many coming to faith. And so now they decided to make it their way of life. So they have noon to one prayer every day at the church, which many participate in. Uh, many in the ministry teams, they pray by conference call every morning as a way to start the day, um, something like at 6 a.m. or something. Also, the, with the 40 ministry teams of the church, they uh, have a, at least once a month an all-day prayer and worship session, just uh, encourage them spiritually. And even the pastor, he's decided he's going to call all the men to a 40-day fast here in the next couple of weeks and ask them all to come to the church and pray together in the morning before they go to work during those 40 days. Now that's amazing and that's incredible and that's unheard of in so many sectors in American Christianity, but that's common in our own history and it's common in the international church. And I'm persuaded in a deep way that to the extent that the United States, that we recapture that level of spirituality and love for Jesus Christ, he, in turn, will release his power on us in extraordinary, wonderful ways. And it's not a one-for-one one in that everything we ask for, the Lord will do exactly. It doesn't work that way. Because what he rewards us with when we seek him is his presence. It's him. 
And with him comes all sorts of delightful things. But it doesn't mean there aren't persecutions and hardships. Uh, they're certainly there. And it doesn't mean the particular people we are praying for to come to faith in Christ will come. You know, there's no guarantees. But it does uh, result in a lot of great changes in terms of aliveness and a devotion to God. Usually many more coming to faith in Christ and so many other wonderful things. You know, our own uh, revival history in the United States has had such an influence internationally. The pastor of the largest church in the world in Seoul, Korea, he's actually learned from America's history, I think, more than we have. You know, the last kind of broad great awakening we've had in this country, people attribute to the businessmen's uh, revival started in New York City. How many of you heard of that story before? Okay, maybe 25% um, of you. It started in New York City in 1857 with a prayer meeting at the Dutch Reformed Church and a man named Jeremiah Lanfear called people to pray. And the prayer meetings grew each week from just a handful and to uh, 20s and 30 people there. And they, they moved to, to doing it every day. And what was amazing is the reason why he started the prayer meeting, he was doing door-to-door -door evangelism in parts of Manhattan. And he was so discouraged, he needed to, to be encouraged. And so he prayed and it started, he invited others to kind of do it with him. And the prayer meetings just start to multiply. And through New York City, just thousands and thousands of people would pray. And it spread across the country. It went to Cincinnati and uh, Portland and uh, all, all the major cities. And you can go back and read the headlines where it says, whole city stops to pray in the middle of the day. It was amazing. And out of a population of 30 million in those days, which is one-tenth of what America is today, a million people came to faith in Christ in just a year and a half. Now that's amazing. And the movement jumped to Australia, a million people came to faith in Christ there. And it jumped to the United Kingdom, a million people came to faith in Christ there. Absolutely wonderful. Now it died down, people stopped praying with that level of intensity and then the kind of country moved on. Well this pastor in Korea, David Cho, he asked himself the question, what if we continue to pray and seek God with that same level of intensity? Could we expect these continuous outpourings of the spirits in some, some way? Well, uh, the answer to that is he's found is yes, as we can continue to seek God, he continues to respond in dramatic and powerful ways. Now his church has about a million members, the largest in the world, it's extraordinary. And this characterizes the Korean church as well as so many other churches around the world, which is amazing. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for us, when you hear, at least when I used to hear stories like this, it can be a little overwhelming to know how to start and in what ways, how can we gather others and encourage each other to seek the Lord in this ways. Um, but the good news is the Lord will help us. He will stretch us. He will allow us and put us in touch with people to stretch our own prayer lives and to um, develop in this way and to learn how to fast if you've never done this and to put it all together and reconcile this with other parts of theology that you have. The Lord is with us. He loves us and wants us to grow even more than we do. So don't let hearing these stories kind of overwhelm you or paralyze you in some ways, but think about it as a, something that can inspire you of something you can get towards in time. Because as you take these steps, as we take these steps, God will respond and bless us in some wonderful ways. So it's my conviction that this lifestyle of seeking God with this kind of energy is absolutely needed. Of course, not just in the most influential sectors of our nation, but in all sectors of our nation is what we need. And so to kind of wrap up this one point, I'm just gonna mention the other two briefly. That I think more than anything has to do with why God is doing so much on these campuses because of a spiritual aliveness coming as a very strong emphasis on seeking the Lord with their whole hearts. But briefly, I wanna mention a couple of other values our ministry has, and that is one of, of intellectual engagement. These places are places that value the life of the mind. If we don't speak and teach in those ways, then it doesn't really reach these students. We find a lot of students who come in who uh, grew up in a place where they didn't have the capacity to integrate their minds with their um, with uh, academic matters and their faith in some ways that uh, they've been longing and wanting. If, if they don't have the chance to think about the faith in a deep intellectual way, it never becomes real for them. So because of that, most of our people have advanced degrees in theology, some PhDs in New Testament, Old Testament, systematic theology. So it really helps the students. So we find that an absolutely uh, essential sort of characteristic. And the third of uh, 
value I want to mention of our ministry, which we praise the Lord for, is very much of an engaged sort of mindset, a mindset where people are reaching out, seeking to make an impact on campus, of course evangelistically, but in every other way. And I was just talking to David Hanks, you know, his daughter Dottie, when she was at uh, Princeton, had that sort of posture and mindset, which was wonderful, in a respectful way, and yet in a persistent way, challenging aspects of a culture that are contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need a lot of that, and we as um, staff uh, model that, and then we also encourage the students to do that as well. And I was really encouraged recently when, um, in that one of our ministry fellows at uh, Princeton and some of the students have been engaging a New Testament professor there named Elaine Pagels. She is the kind of theological person behind a lot of the D Dan Brown movies and uh, books and, and the movies, Da Vinci Code coming out of that. And um, they have successfully been able to, in a, in a respectful way, in a way that's consistent with an academic approach, challenge her on some of her assumptions about the Gospels and which ones are reliable and which ones aren't. And we praise God that she um, has been very cooperative and responsive. It hasn't been in any way an antagonistic sort of relationship. But it, it takes students who have the courage to address this uh, with the professors in a respectful way. And we praise God for the students who have that respectful yet deliberate sort of uh, engagement. You know, another example I want to mention of engagement is something that students at uh, Yale started recently. Um, it started when uh, one of the athletes on campus, a basketball player, someone came up to him and said, hey, you know, the team's going out uh, drinking uh, tonight and you want to kind of come do that with us. And he says, no, man, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm with Team Sober. I'm not going to go do that with you guys ton tonight. And uh, the name kind of stuck. And so what they started on campus is something they call Team Sober, which is a collection of students um, seeking to uh, not drink until they're 21, and when they are 21, to uh, not drink to excess. And it's beginning to spread to some of the other campuses, which is exciting, and that the students would have a heart and mindset to challenge the binge drinking culture. You know, sadly, many students graduate from here, and some maybe end up being alcoholics because of all the pressure and emphasis on drinking to excess as a way of dealing with stress in their lives. So we praise God for those students who have that heart and that initiative, and we seek to encourage that to increase um, all the more so that lives can be blessed and changed in wonderful and extraordinary ways. So um, I think I'm kind of running out of time here. We're about time to wrap up. About three minutes. Okay, that's time. <laughs> Thank you for that. Let's see. You know, um, one comment that a professor made at the, about the Harvard ministry, it's always so touching to me. He has sponsored, he's a professor in the law school, and he's an officially faculty sponsor. He came to one of the meetings uh, the Harvard students recently uh, that we have. We have a lecture series every Friday night on each of the campuses. And he wrote an email afterwards and he says, you know, uh, he loved his time to being with all the students. He'd never seen anything like that on campus yet. He says it was truly magical and astonishing. He had never seen anything like it. And uh, he was remarking on the spiritual aliveness and the devotion of the students, which is wonderful. And when I hear comments like that and get emails like that, it's such a blessing and encouragement to me. It's such a reminder of, of me to give leadership on the emphasis of seeking the Lord with the, the whole heart, our whole hearts so as to model that for the students. Because the Lord responds, the Lord loves, and He is changing lives in extraordinary and wonderful ways. And so in closing, I just want to thank all of you again for your hospitality for this weekend. It's been a wonderful experience and wonderful to see even up close in a more deliberate way the Westminster schools and what y'all have been doing through that school for many years now. And I pray that all the more success for the schools and for your church, especially as you move back into your amazing sanctuary. I got a little peek a little earlier. Um, it's extraordinary. So um, let me say a prayer and uh, we'll be done. Lord Jesus, we love and praise and, and honor your great and glorious name. I ask for your blessing on First Presbyterian Church of Augusta. Thank you for the way you've used this church from many years ago, from President Woodrow Wilson to, to so many others throughout the years, and continue to use this church and the schools, um, Westminster, Westminster schools, to do um, wonderful and extraordinary things in the larger culture, Lord. We need your power, Lord. We need your presence. We want to see the name of Jesus Christ glorified. In his name, amen.